afternoon, it's Kawi Lucas today at a different time. If you are looking for De uh, Ted, we did a little swap today so you can catch him on the YouTube reruns. Today, it's Kawi Lucas with Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii. I have two guests today freshly flown in <laughs> from Hawaii Island, the Hamakua and Kornicide. Um, first up, we have Craig Elevich who I last saw at um, Bishop Museum talking about ulu, breadfruit, in just amazing ways. And I heard he was coming to the island for the breadfruit summit, actually. And he says, you know, I'm bringing, I'm bringing this guy, Kalani Souza. I'm going to bring him along with me. And yes, please bring Kalani Souza with you. So Kalani is a native Hawaiian practitioner, and he's a FEMA trainer, and he is just a phenomenal human being. So thank you gentlemen for stopping by the Think Tech studio on your way out to La Ie this weekend. Thanks so much for having us. We love Think Tech, <laughs> big fans, <laughs> on the mailing list. Well, um, uh, as I build this show, um, agroforestry is the way to help us really become more resilient at home. Right, Craig? Absolutely, absolutely. When the first Europeans came to Hawaii, they observed some of the most abundant and well-kept agricultural systems in the world. And those were agroforestry systems. Very diverse, very productive, sustainable, and guess what? Carbon neutral. Hey! <laughs> so there was no, no need to burn fossil fuel to produce all of the food that was produced here, which was a huge amount. A huge amount, enough to supply uh, visiting sailors for months at a time, rather generously, evidently. <laughs> right, well... <laughs> Much to it, our dismay. <laughs> it's calculated, yes, um, that the breadfruit groves, which were um, quite prominent parts of the landscape in Hawaii, very productive, these breadfruit groves, um, that, that just one of them in Kona, which is about nine square miles, called the Kalaulu, produced... 40 to 80 million pounds of breadfruit per day, per, wow. per, per year, okay? Per year. 40 to wow. 80 million pounds per year. You can compare that to the amount of potato we import to Hawaii per year now, which is about that amount. That was all one forest, one, one forest, forest. forest. On one island. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you guys are here, and you're going to be talking about that all weekend long at this uh, breadfruit summit. Right. And uh, if anybody's interested, they can go online and check it out. The, just Google uh, Global Breadfruit Summit 2016. That what makes it there. exciting, really <laughs> exciting this time is, I mean, normally whenever you see these agricultural developments or a new rollout, it's almost always driven at the economic level. You know, I, I'm kind of quoting W, you know, and, and, and his pops, right? It's the economy, stupid, right? That sort of idea. However, this time, it's a collection of, of practitioners deeply rooted in their communities, and they're coming from all over the Pacific, from Tahiti, from Fiji, from Tonga, Micronesia, um, and of course all of us from the islands here, and we're meeting there, and the conversation's being led by communities, sort of in this real organic, natural way. It I, feels good. It, it looks good. Um, I hope to be up there for part of it. But since we have you here, all to, all to myself, um, for a few minutes, um, let's, let's get into what can we do here in Hawaii about food security and how can we approach our, our home gardens and as well as our, our businesses in, in agroforestry. Um, you sent me some excellent pictures to kind of get it a, a picture of what is agroforestry. So our, our background here is beautiful avapuhi and eucalyptus. Right. And talk about the different functions. Yeah, so, so in nature, plants facilitate each other. We kind of, I was raised to think that plants compete with each other for water, nutrients, light, and so forth. But in nature, plants facilitate each other, actually. And they, they actually feed each other and communicate with each other. And in the case of this very simple agroforestry system, the avapuhi and eucalyptus, the, the avapuhi is providing a cover on the ground. It's holding soil together. It's building soil through organic matter. And the eucalyptus is coming up, and it's a long-term. This is a timber eucalyptus in this photo. Yeah. 
Okay, and let's look at um, maybe um, this, the, I, I call it the breakfast forest, the one that's got citrus, <laughs> um, coffee, and mango. <laughs> yeah. So here's a mature agroforest um, from the Pacific somewhere. Is this in Hawaii? Actually, this is in Kona. I, I sent this because I came to Holuoloa in Kona in 1988. This is what inspired me to work on agroforestry. All the old family farms there, coffee farms, are integrated with lots of food. And one of the things when you go to Kona, there's always too much food around, too much citrus. People share it with each other. Banana, um, avocado, mango. That's kind of... Oranges. Oranges. Yeah. Fabulous cold oranges. Right, so the, the, the abundance is really... So the, the yeah. numbers on the screen here the, are, are the IDing the different kinds of trees? Yes. So um, number one is... Number one is uh, citrus. Number two is the coffee, which is an understory, shade tolerant. And number three is the mango. Yum! Okay, so um, one of the things that is a struggle for a lot of people in agriculture is this um, idea of, of weed. What do we do about the weeds? How do we keep those nasty grasses down? Well, agroforestry has an answer to that, right? Right. Ground covers. Right. And I think what makes it exciting is, you know, it's scalable. When you look at those first two photos, I think some people get the idea that agroforestry, they start thinking acres and acres. But uh, we designed a 10 by 23 foot plot on an R1 residential home that can feed a family of four for four days in an emergency, like say a category four hurricane here. And I'd love to see projects in education systems that sort of pick this up, this idea that homes on Oahu, in okay. particular where the risk is, that homes have developed their own capacity to have food in their yard for three or four days in the event of a, of a, a Katrina or a, you know, like we had with Eva, yeah. you know, when it hit Oahu. So that's not a lot of space, really. No, 10 by 23. The, where we're sitting here on this table, you know, it's like a, this table alone is a <laughs> five by eight space. So you can imagine it's not much larger than this feed a family of four. So what would you plant in your theory? Well, my theoretical garden, which we videotaped and, and recorded over the last three years as okay. we extract, <laughs> I have shizo, ava, banana, uh, chaya, three kinds of potato, three kinds of spinach, uh, hao, olena, ginger, green beans, uh, the chaya, I have sheets of leaves that, that are different, green and red, back to front. I'm also growing papaya. I got three different kinds of papaya going. I got green beans. I, of course, the green onions, the white onions, you know, uh, celery. I had peppers, but the birds got to them. <laughs> you know, and this has been going on for three years. And when I started on this particular plot, which is right next to the kitchen window, the soil was so degraded. The person I bought the house from had had two dogs staked on the property for eight years. Oh. So it was just red dirt and yeah. fleas. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I'd arrest this guy for what he did to those animals, but got the house, cleaned up the yard. We did the entire soil regeneration naturally with no inputs at all, simply letting the plants come into working order with each other. And right now, the oregano, all the other stuff there is standing about. 24 inches high and the ground cover is complete and there's no grass, no weeds. No glass, no weeds. So that, back to that uh, uh, yes. ground cover, you had a, a, a great picture of one that was, um, oh, the perennial peanut. Yes. Right. Yeah, there's, uh, that's an interesting one. It's a great ground cover. It fixes nitrogen. It keeps the weeds out. The idea is open, bare soil. Nature wants to fill. So it will. It's a vacuum. It will. And so what we do is we use ground covers or whatever actually is there um, already that might, you might consider to be a weed, but is very innocuous, very harmless. So, um, but uh, in this photo, the, the perennial peanut is a wonderful ground cover. Many times those are actually beneficial and somehow we've been acculturized to go out there every Saturday and remove them. 
And then, uh, and then put lots of chemical fertilizers yeah. to make the grass grow. To make the grass grow. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. But um, uh, these um, agroforests aren't exclusive to plants, right? There's, there's, you talked about silva pa pasturing and adding, adding animals into the mixture of agroforestry. And that's easier to do probably on Hawaii Island than Oahu, but, but let's talk about it. And um, there's a gorgeous um, uh, pastoral view of, of what life could be like. Right. Well, it's wonderful to integrate animals with trees. The animals actually keep the ground cover maintained and mowed. And um, most animals do better under some forest cover. Cattle do better under 50% shade, for example. Yeah, I mean, putting cattle out in an open field is tantamount to abuse. It is, and, and by putting them in, in a, a pasture that has trees, whether they're timber trees or fruit trees, an open, an open canopy, um, you get the benefits of the trees, the yields of the trees, you have healthier livestock, and you actually do not reduce the number of animals that you can um, that you can uh, uh, support on the on an area of land. Okay, so the the benefits to the um, animals are, are pretty obvious, um, but um, to the farmer. Um, sometimes there's this thing called uh, the USDA that comes in and says, if you've got animals, then you're not an or organic operation and we, we won't sell your, um, your produce. There, is a, a, there are some issues with food safety. Is that what you're, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's so really... You, do, you, um, do you know where that is at this point in, in, in uh, political uh, America? Well, um... The United I, States, I should say. Sorry. Right. <laughs> sorry to you, South Americans. I, <laughs> Thank you for that. The, the food safety issue has to do with picking up anything from the ground and having animals around. Um, so I, I think that f that issue is still it's current. It's still on yeah. the table. Mm -hmm. okay. I think all of those issues between food safety and food security are still being discussed, by, particularly by the NDPC, the National Dis Disaster Preparedness Centers, you know, these consortiums. There's seven consortiums paid for by FEMA that actually address different aspects of readiness in the nation. So that an ongoing discussion, that discussion was centered in Baton Rouge at LSU, where the Center for Food Safety and Food Security is being operated. But as we know, they're experiencing some real uh, challenges this last week. The floods in Baton Rouge, uh, everything that's happening in Louisiana. I think there's some hurricanes headed there. So if there was ever a moment for them to learn some lessons about food security or readiness on the ground, I'm afraid my colleagues and friends over there are having the real life experience in the moment. So the discussion that immediately follows this week's events should be very interesting indeed around whether food should be available. That being said, I want to comment that 2017 is the 100 year anniversary of the United States legislation around victory gardens. Once in America, it was legislated, it was mandated into law that all houses should have a garden. It was a victory garden for the security and safety of the nation. Listen, if our defense spending is going up to 53% and we're throwing a giant chunk after national security and domestic preparedness, then why aren't we having federal programs that are in fact supporting the idea of readiness in terms of victory gardens for our citizens? It was mandated by law. I think that is a very good question. Mm. Mm. Uh, something I hope to think there will about. Be something uh, d uh, generated either this weekend at, at your conference or maybe at the IUCN or oh, I'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. a conservation measure, but it's definitely a, a food security measure, mm -hmm. and um, maybe that's a way to get some of the defense dollars going to a more uh, positive. Mm -hmm. uh, part of our economy. Right. Well, I know we probably got a break coming up real quick. And uh, if that's going to be the case, maybe when we come back, I can nudge my pal here to tell you about his dream of peace gardens, which I thought was phenomenal. Perfect, Kalani. Let's do that. <laughs> Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday.
here on Think Tech Hoi. Hi, my name is Justini Spiritu. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m., we host the Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. This is the place you can come to for insight on the perspective and history and passions of Hawaii's farmers and all folks involved in Hawaii's local food system. What kind of folks do we have on? So we have everyone from local farmers, we have foodies, chefs, we also have journalists, uh, researchers, anyone who's actually working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So join us every Thursday and uh, tweet in to us and ask us some questions and leave your comments as well. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas, and with me here today is Kalani Silva. Susa! Susa, Silva, those Portuguese, they're all over the place, you know. And Craig Elovich from Hawaii Island. They are here for the Global Breadfruit Summit, and both of them are extremely busy and do amazing things all across the globe in the realm of food sovereignty and. Um, and, and disaster management also. It's, it's a very interesting mix that you've got your, yourself um, uh, active in. And um, Craig, you sent me this uh, excellent infographic that shows why you guys are so passionate about agroforestry. Um, we're comparing uh, monocropping with an agroforestry um, right. production. So the concepts behind agroforestry resonate with a lot of people, but people don't change unless they see benefits that outweigh what they've been doing before. So monocultures, if you look in the, well, in this case, the annual crop um, graph on the left, they have a certain yield over time. Agroforests have a higher total yield if you look at all the different crops growing in the system. So there's short-term crops that produce a lot of food during their first six months to five years of their lives. And then we have medium-term crops that produce the bulk of their food um, between, let's say, three years and 10 years. And then we have the very long-term crops. So that would be something like the short-term would be pineapples, papayas, those kinds of things. Short-term is pineapples? Yes. Oh. Two years, Craig, don't call that short term. Well, if you do it right and you plant <laughs> ratoons, you can get your first crop within 18 months. Okay, well, we'll see. I, I have a, <laughs> mine is this big now. Okay, okay. lots and of I'm, mulch. Lots of mulch, okay. I got lots of mulch and I've got three gorgeous suckers on it, so okay, those good. Will, I'm going to time those. Okay. Yeah. It's that love affair with the pineapple, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like them for the cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Kalani, we have a picture of, of you and a one-month-old, a baby agroforestry plot um, th uh, that you put together somewhere. Oh, on. yes, yes. This is uh, in, in Poilo, another one down south. You should see this plot now two years later. It's... Uh, you literally walk under it and are completely lost. Within the first year went down. This agroforest right here that we're in this small plot, this entire plot was planted in one night on the Hoku Moon after oh. sunset till midnight. It's the tradition of Taro and Inlas in the traditional way. And uh, it's quite amazing. The food that's come out of this has fed about three or four households consistently for the last few years now. Wow, that is and, beautiful. Uh, and literally put in with just three individuals. And, and what you see there is a whole variety of different food plants planted together all at the same time there's ground covers there's shrubs and trees so there's there's sweet potato there's tea leaf as you can see there's chili peppers the kalo that he mentioned and that's only a month old yeah look at all of that yeah wow. yeah and it's been it's been feeding consistently yes. for three years it feeds itself or two years yeah Right, the inputs, uh, the inputs like the so, rain when the rain comes, you know. And, <laughs> and you planted it in one night, but you had some help. Uh, okay. Three <laughs> other individuals. Okay. So yeah. just four of us. Four of us. Okay. In one night, planted it. Amazing. So, and and didn't it wasn't like a lot of work. We had some cocktails, you know. Somebody <laughs> made dinner, and we had us a good time from sunset at about five 
to about midnight that night. Oh, when it's nice and cool. Yeah, yeah, that's when the <laughs> wines would have been planting. And uh, then you don't have to worry about slathering yourself with... Exactly, uh, <laughs> exactly. Isn't that interesting? You know, there's actually a, a portion of the day around 2, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to about 4.30 that's called Oh in Allah. Oh, me, I, E, here, a lot in the day. Me out in the day. So it actually tells you you don't go walking outside till like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's actually what the wines call that time of day. Right, it's, which is interesting, right? But so when we see people toiling away at like 11.30, it's like, pal, what are you doing? Out of the sun. Should have given that up at 8 o'clock in the morning. Go to the beach, relax. That sounds like a much more balanced lifestyle. It turns out that the metrics of profit extend way beyond monetization. Yes, but we have to get somebody who knows how to do that kind of thinking to put it on paper so it gets included. That's that's why, that's why I love Craig Elevich, you know, because he, he's managed. So I agree with you. When I heard him do his first talk, too, I was like, this guy is actually encapsulating in theory, in a way that others can hear some of these deeply held values that indigenous people have had. And he surprised me. I was looking at him like, really? Menlo Park, right? Or, you know, Palo Alto, <laughs> really? How'd you do that? Right? Because I've all, I've, we've all been up to Palo Alto. I was like, how'd you do that, pal? More trees, I guess, than down in LA. <laughs> <laughs> so, Craig, you have been on Hawaii Island for a long time. Since 88. I came to uh, Honolulu and Kona in 88. Yeah. So, I didn't know you when I was living in Honolulu. Oh, I was living on an old macnut farm. Right. Um, yeah, feeding the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, so there was a project that you did there that I wanted a gleaning project, a community gathering project. I wanted you to talk about that a little. Right. So, one of the things about working with Ulu, breadfruit, is that it's becoming a commercial crop, it's kind of becoming a hot commercial crop. But we wanted to make sure that the people who were most deeply connected to the Ulu, the local people, Hawaiians, Pacific, Pacific Islanders, had access to it. And there's a lot of breadfruit that goes to waste during the peak seasons. There's these, as you know, peaks of production where we actually can't consume all that we produce. There's a lot of fruit. We maybe consume 15 percent. Right. Maybe. Wow, that's maybe 15 percent. So the project is, uh, it's still ongoing, is to harvest some of that excess fruit during the peak seasons. And we, um, we didn't put it into commercial channels, but we wanted to make sure that people who really appreciate it um, got access to it. We had one person call us up and say, my family doesn't feel right going to bed. Um, without having the taste of breadfruit that day. So we have been thousands of pounds we've harvested as volunteers um, and just donated to different local groups, church groups, community groups who... And that's um, what I mean, these metrics that you can't see otherwise, right, that are benefiting society greatly, and all of us really in that aspect. And then when we start talking, and I really do not like this, this terminology, and I think with IUCN we're going to be hearing something like these, uh, you know, refugees, climate refugees. Mm. They're migrants. They're migrants and they should be migrants with dignity. Migration is a natural phenomenon on the planet. During the cycles of climate, all life forms migrate. The humans are about to stop migrating to the coast and to begin migrating into rural areas. And from some extreme conditions, humans will be migrating to other countries. This idea of agroforestry, it's a way of getting a really skilled set of people from Micronesia who are going to find themselves having to relocate. This is an industry they could excel in. We don't have to pay them seven twenty-five to be APCOA parking lot attendants. Mm. And we don't have to train people for 15 years to learn that skill. We have an influx, an influx of people coming in who are extremely skilled at this particular kind of activity. Why don't we match our economic industrial development to our marketplace, to our talent, right, to the people that are coming in? We could do this. Well, let's, let's just work on that. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a goal we can work on. Now in our last three minutes, gentlemen, mm -hmm. 
Um, why don't, um, I would just like to hear from you uh, what you are most excited about um, in agroforestry these days. I would say the agroforestry home gardens, like we saw the, the um, one month example up there. Are you going to show the one year photo, maybe some, sometime? Um, but, but the agroforestry home gardens, where people can directly uh, relate to their food mm. and create abundance and also learn about growing food without actually spending any more time and money than on their ornamental landscapes. So that's what, that's what... In fact, significantly less. I was going to say significantly Sig It could be and significantly And it's more fun. Absolutely. <laughs> you cannot eat your Absolutely. lawn. Right, right. That's, <laughs> what, that's, what it, that's what excites me, and that's what... And Pacific children, Island. children around growing food changes their entire relationship with the natural world. Right. So we, we have an aging um, uh, farmer uh, population well, this, the, the agroforestry home garden can actually reverse that trend yeah. by, by training people, like Colin is saying, from birth. And you are director of agroforestry.net, yes. and there is a lot of information on that website, agroforestry.net. And he's also going to be the new director of the Global Breadfruit Heritage Council, which is really made up of like 15, 16 indigenous leaders from all over the Caribbean, from Indian Ocean, from Myanmar, from all over the Pacific. Several people on the technical advisory team. I mean. Craig just does wonderful work. You know, he's a stand-up guy. It's a pleasure working with him. All right, Kalani, in our last 30 seconds or so, what's your great, what are you most excited about? I think giving communities the ability to control their own food, water, energy needs, the hierarchy of needs, health and education. What could be more exciting than that than putting economic development back into the hands of the women and children and community? That's where we need to go. We want to break up these big monopolies, empower women in their communities. Oh, how beautiful is that for a vision? <laughs> Thank you both for stopping by Thank you. downtown Thank Honolulu you, Colin, what on a your pleasure. way to the uh, Breakfast Summit out in La Ie. Thank you. Thank you.